Hello, um, just a very quick video, I'll try and make it as quick as I can. Uh, quick video on the updated turbine as of build 254439, that's the, uh, the occupational upgrade release build. Um, I have had a version of this on the forums for a day or so now. Um, it's a build I've been tinkering with with the new steam turbine. Um, they made some changes to the turbine and it now requires uh, a lot more heat to run. Um, so the previous build I did, uh, I did a little video on uh, this build here, which was pumping in water, cooking it with a tepidizer, and uh, yeah, that was it really. It generated power, the water condensed, we got two kilowatts of power. Um, this was great, um, but then they brought in a change that meant that turbines needed to be kept at 260 degrees. So as you see, these here. Uh, are just too cold. And I was tinkering with a lot of different builds. We had a big old build up here and uh, another monster up here and essentially they're just all too cold. Tepidizers are not man enough for the job. Um, also did an aqua tuna build down here but just can't can't make it big enough. So I made this thing. Uh, this is the derp bine. Um, essentially what we've got here is a similar concept. Uh, ignore all this crap over here, that's for something else. It's a similar concept as what we had before in regards we are using tepidizers to turn uh, water into steam, uh, but then we are also further cooking that steam now with magma or igneous rock, uh, which is what magma turns into when it cools down a bit. Um, basically what we're going to try and do with this build, and the, the whole point of this build, is to try and remove as much of the energy cost from making water into steam as possible before it hits our magma okay so what i've basically got here is i'll, I'll go through it in steps we've got a tank here that's simulating where your water is going to come from in the first place and as you can see it's 100 degrees the idea being that you've used a tepidizer or geyser water or whatever to get your water as hot as you can before it even enters your boiler room now we have two chambers we'll look at the boiler room first of all um, again, I want to keep this video short, so I'm going to try and be as quick as I can, but we've got essentially three tepidizers in the center of the room here. Um, we don't need three tepidizers, but in the essence of speed and also a little bit of symmetry, we went with it. Uh, these are basically submerged in oil with a pocket of gas, as we've done many times before. Um, and these are being fed water through this pump up here, which feeds water through a liquid shutoff here. Uh, all this is controlled with automation, but I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and that feeds the water into these two valves. These valves are currently set at 2,000 uh, grams per second, so 2 kilos per second. Two valves, 4 kilos a second. This thing eats water. Okay, So this is pretty much not far off a full geyser being used just for this. Um, what this then does is splits this water over three different vents. Reason being, we get a nice even uh, temperature dis distribution across our hot plate, and then it just boils instantly into steam. Okay, um, at which point uh, the steam gathers up in the room. We've got a few Atmo sensors over here which trigger our um, steam moving um, doors, which basically push the steam down here. It goes on its merry way and gets pushed into this bottom chamber. Oop, okay. That is the first step of the boiling. So we've basically taken the water that was previously 100 degrees, turned it into steam at 118 to, yeah, 118 ish degrees. It was a little bit hotter before, but I've been tinkering about changing some doors and stuff. But it's about, it goes to about 130 odd degrees when it's fully running full whack. Um, our thermo switch in this pool of oil here um, is basically saying keep running the tepidizers until we get to 135 degrees. So as you can see, it sort of ma manages itself. Now, once the steam gets to the second chamber, so it's down here, we then have what was previously two pools of magma. Now, these have cooled off a little bit. Um, this has been running for quite a few cycles now, in fairness, probably 20-ish cycles. Um, and as you can see, it's now turned into igneous rock, which is basically what magma turns into when it goes below, I think it's like 1600 degrees or something like that. Um, I can probably tell you. Um, Mm, freezing point? 1400 degrees. <laughs> so we've got uh, basically igneous rock here, but that's fine. Igneous rock still has lots of energy in it. Um, and what this is basically doing, we've got this contained within a vacuum. So if we look at our temperature overlay, you can actually see that the rest of the room is cold. 
this, these ladders and things here, these are just to simulate how you'd be able to get into the room to feed it with more lava as and when you needed it. The problem with lava is it's finite, okay? That means once the energy's gone, it turns into rock. Once the rock cools down, it's useless. So you'd have to have a duper sign to dig this out, replenish the lava, and so on and so on. This isn't a maintenance-free build. This probably needs a full-time dupe doing nothing but keeping an eye on the magma, digging out if it turns to rock, topping it back up with magma. So it isn't a perfect build. I don't think any will be, to be honest, if we've got to use magma. But anyway, the main thing I would say to avoid here, I know I've built these water locks, avoid um, having a dupe move with magma in a bottle through water locks. So if I was going to do this build myself, I would have my magma, um, the entire area of vacuum, so that my dupe would not have to walk through liquid. As soon as they step foot in this liquid, the magma bottle they're holding starts cooling down, which means you lose that energy straight away. You want to basically have a straight route from your magma to the source that it's going, all in a vacuum. Use exosuits, use whatever you want, just have them working in a vacuum, otherwise you lose energy before you've even started. Anyway, uh, side run over. Once your steam is down into the main cooking chamber, what we've basically got is some temp shift plates and some airlocks, okay? The airlocks are in contact with the lava or the igneous rock or whatever, um, and these are also governed by a temperature switch, which is up here. This basically says if the temperature goes above a certain temperature, toggle this central airlock, okay? And all that basically does, uh, oh, I need to toggle on debug. Uh, all that basically does is toggles the central door and makes that into a vacuum. Once this middle door is a vacuum, the heat transfer stops, meaning that we stop cooking our steam on this upper side of the boiler, okay? What we then have down here is another central column of airlocks and what these basically do at different intervals throughout the day so it's probably going to happen quite soon these will open collect all this steam from up here it basically creates a vacuum again behind these airlocks meaning this steam that's currently at 84 kilos will rush into this space and then get pushed down to the bottom here okay down here is where our steam gathers so you can actually watch this happen now if you want oh bit of lag so you can see the steam just rushing into this space and then these airlocks shut behind it Boop. And push it all the way down okay the steam then gathers up in this this area here um, and then I've got a little balancing chamber here which basically takes the steam from both of these tiles and sort of equalizes it out a little bit I was finding that steam was gathering up on one side more than the other so as you can see we've got 520 kilos versus 480 this just balances it a little bit steam can flow both ways it's really toasty hot down here because we've basically got an airflow tile mixed with some temp shift plates behind our steam turbine to keep it at 297 297 degrees which is more than what we need um, again this will need to be topped up occasionally but only needs to be topped up once this igneous rock drops below sort of 300 degrees and you can see by how slow it's it's changing it's, it's going to take a while um and don't forget, the temperature is transferred throughout the entire body of rock as well, so uh, it does take a long time to go through your, your lava. Um, and that's that basically, that is the, the principle of the build. There is quite a bit of automation behind it, however honestly, it looks more than it is. Uh, a lot of the automation here is solely for doing the airlocks, making sure the steam's pushed down at the right time. Uh, we've got a bit of um, a circuit here, I think it was Moggles, I think, on the forums. Um, this is a little build that he has for having two Atmo switches, um, just basically governing the, the the pressure at which point our Atmo switches tick on, um, which is cool. Um, the flow of water into the room itself, I should probably explain. We do have um, a hydro sensor on an AND gate with an Atmo sensor. Okay, the Atmo sensor is basically saying if there is uh, less than 19 kilos of steam in this tile. And if there is less than 20 kilos of water on this hot plate, turn this pump on, okay? Realistically, this hydro sensor is never needed, but it's a fail safe. If ever something goes wrong, our tepidizers melt, something weird happens and we end up with a big pool of water on here, I want this thing to stop pumping in water straight away. So that's all this does. Just means we don't end up with a mess layer, basically. Um, ignore this switch up here. That's just for me manually toggling on and off my pump. Uh, what else do we have? The tepidizers themselves are running intermittently, so they use actually use very little, very little power altogether. Considering we have three tepidizers here, it uses next to no power, and the reason for that is it's on a um, a pulse clock, which basically is a buffer gate and a not gate. And the buffer gate you can set to whatever pulse that you want. 
what this basically does is toggle on and off rapidly. Okay, so if I show you in this screen, you can see what it's doing. Okay, this is on an AND gate as well with a thermo switch. Dead easy. Thermo switch is submerged in the oil in the tepidizer pool. And what it's basically saying is if the temperature is below 135 degrees um, plus the pulse signal, toggle on. It's as simple as that. If it goes above that, it turns off. Uh, likewise, I mentioned before, there's a thermo switch down here to toggle my uh, magma on and off. That's just this switch here, um, which basically turns the central airlock on or off, depending on whether we want it in contact with, and so transferring the heat, or a vacuum in the middle, so it's not transferring the heat. Simple as that. Uh, and that's the build, basically. Um, it looks very complicated. I won't lie to you. It was a nightmare to build. Uh, it would be a nightmare not in debug. I will tell you that now. Um, would I build one on stream? I think I'm probably going to have to. Uh, is it going to be a headache? I reckon so. But um, yeah, I just thought I'd show that. I will post this video on the forums as well for the guys that are... There's a massive thread on the forums about steam turbines. So if you haven't already, please do check out the clay forums because some really cool guys on there that come up with some really intelligent stuff. Um, so I hope that helps and that will be me done. Much love. Take care. Bye-bye.